A hit and run at a busy intersection. The car just came out of nowhere. One runner nearly becomes roadkill. You can see all his muscles literally just detaching from the bones. Hear his story of survival. Plus, she believes miracles can be part of everyday life. People with all sorts of diseases, cirrhosis of the liver, you name it, God does it. Catherine Ruinala shares about living in the miraculous, all on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. Could you actually be addicted to your smartphone? Well, according to the Center for Internet and Technology Addiction, the percentage of smartphone users who would actually be classified as addicted is somewhere between 10 and 12 percent. And let's add to that, 90 percent of all Americans fall into the categ category of overusing, misusing, or abusing their device. Well, the move to curb phone addiction is the new focus of Apple and Google Android. Both have new features that are designed to help users get a grip on their smartphone habits. The new tools will show how much time people are spending on devices, the number of times they pick up the phone, and how many notifications they've received. Apple's also providing a new dial that lets you set limits on how much time you use an app with an alert that lets you know when your time is up. Get off of here. <laughs> it will then block your access if you try to launch that app. Parents will also have tools to control what their kids can see and how long they can see it. That seems like a good idea to me. <laughs> so so I'm not supposed to have this on the set? Uh, no, uh, and it, often it I, dings when we're I, during this show, dang, may I say. It, it dings, yes. it dings. <laughs> Those, those are my alerts to let me know I'm overusing it. Yes, exactly. It, good there's not a, a voice that speaks yeah. from it. But you know the but average the person, yeah, okay. what? You go first. Well, the average I'm, person? Five five hours a day. I'm, I, not, I'm not five hours. No, I don't, so I don't I'm, do I'm way below average on that. But, I, you know, it's talking about the number of times you pick up the phone or just check to see if there's something on it. I mean, I wonder if we had that on our phones, how much time it would actually we're doing that. We might be worse than we think. <laughs> Just saying. I'm powerless over my phone, but Terry has a charger. Uh, yes. So I, I get do. to have it. 11 more steps to go. There you go. Right. <laughs> well, he may be one of the busiest men in the entertainment industry, but don't expect Simon Cowell to respond to a text or answer his phone. The music mogul recently revealed that he has not been on his phone <laughs> in 10 months. He says he became irritated, imagine that, <laughs> with how often he was using his phone and the act of unplugging has really helped him. He says the difference it's made that I became more aware of the people around me. Wow. Wow. And more Ooh. focused. It's been good for my mental health. It's a very strange experience, but it really is good <laughs> for you and has absolutely made me happier. Go imagine. Really? Be happier putting those things down. <laughs> well, research does suggest spending too much time on your phone may be linked to increased stress and anxiety. <laughs> and I, I believe that is absolutely <laughs> true. I, uh, you know, sometimes. The tyranny just, of the urgent. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. It's not just the, the tyranny of the urgent that's coming into you. It's something as simple as somebody making a comment on Facebook and then reading through the vitriolic responses to you all of that. You still have Facebook on your Yes, phone? I do. I do. Because I did. Like, I did delete. Did you Facebook. delete I, Facebook? I didn't want it on the phone. I'm impressed. Yeah. Wow. If, if you're going to spend time on Facebook, it needs to be small amounts of time. Okay. Um, I'll be thinking about that. Yeah. So no, those alerts can. I, I get annoyed with text. I, I get business texts, and there's these you long, hear from long me things. And <laughs> anyway, I'll talk about more problems later. I need somebody to talk to. In this connected <laughs> world where our smartphones keep us in touch with work 24-7, try, try, try and find the right work-life balance. Uh, and I can be personal testimony to it when you say, well, I've got to get rid of this off my phone. But some countries are better at that work-life balance than others, with many making strides to help their employees. Get this, in Japan, it's common for many employees to work 12 or more hours a day. So it's accepted to see them napping on the train or at the park. Bodies everywhere. <laughs> but Tokyo's governor recently ordered municipal workers to finish by 8 p.m. The office lights are all turned off and anyone found at their desk is sent home. In oh. Germany, 
Managers are banned from contacting staff during off hours, and companies like automaker Daimler automatically delete emails sent to their employees on vacation. Amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, in Spain, the law states that the maximum number of hours an employee is allowed to work, allowed to work, must not exceed 40 hours a week. And workers usually have a daily two-hour siesta before returning back to work. And I think I need to move to Spain. La cucaracha. <laughs> <laughs> or something. I don't, I don't know. What. I don't know if I could do that. I'm, I'm one of those overworked guys. I'm you know, definitely, I'm not 12 hours in I'm probably No, 10. but a, a good two-hour nap in the afternoon might be a That's the thing. secret? Yeah. How to know when you're old, when you look forward to a nap in the afternoon. Uh, that's the, let, let that be a sign to you. Yeah. Well, coming up, she's an Australian TV host and pastor who sees miracles happen wherever she goes. We've seen people get organs who had no organs. The deaf healed, diabetes healed. Catherine Ruinala shares how all of us can live in the miraculous. Plus, we'll be praying for you right after this. Catherine Ruinala is known around the world for having a powerful prophetic and healing ministry. But her ministry didn't happen overnight. It began years ago with a genuine desire to know the Holy Spirit. I used to walk through the shopping centers and see little children in wheelchairs with spina bifida. And my heart would break with frustration knowing that the God that I read about in the Bible was telling me that these signs will follow those who believe, and surely that meant me. Catherine Ruinala and her husband Tom pastor a church in Brisbane, Australia. She's also the host of her own TV show. Together, they've seen miracles happen around the world. It's been my delight to see now spina bifida has been healed. We've seen people healed of stage four cancer. We've seen people get organs who had no organs. The deaf healed, diabetes healed. The Holy Spirit wants to use believers to manifest Christ, the glory of God, in signs and wonders and miracles. In her book, Living in the Miraculous, Catherine shares how understanding the Father's love is the key to expecting miracles. Well, Catherine is here with us now. It's great having you here. It's a delight to and be here And you're going with to be you. praying for viewers in just a minute. But before we get to that, um, what was it about, uh, what, what caused you to have a desire to know more about the Holy Spirit? You know, I would read things like Catherine Kuhlman and about her relationship with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit being her best friend. And I remember one day being in the car, listening to an audio Bible, and they were quoting the verse, now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship with the Holy Spirit be with you all. And we used to say that as the grace at school, but it was that day that it really struck me, fellowship, what does that look like? That's That's gotta be a real relationship where you can have conversation. and. From that point on, I just, I began to talk to Him, God the Holy Spirit, as my friend, as my counselor, as my helper. And oh, I tell you, He's our ever-present help in time of need. And my time of needs all the time. So <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> That's a good one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to copy that. My time of need is all the time. <laughs> um, what, what has that led you into? Because I think for you, it was pro a progressive revelation of His power. Oh, very much. It's, it's helped me understand that God uses the weak and foolish things of the world to compound the wise. That's why he uses me. <laughs> yeah, he can use, that, that really, um, the more we lean on him, the, the more we discover his kindness mm -hmm. and that he doesn't, he doesn't look, like Catherine Coleman used to say, he's not looking for golden vessels. He's not looking for silver vessels. He's just looking for yielded vessels. But I discover that more and more that as I journey with him, that his kindness never stops. His kindness is so intense that he uses me whether I feel like I deserve to be used or not. He just delights to use anyone who would say, God, I believe in your goodness and that you want to manifest your goodness to these people that you love. And in doing that, um, the more we experience to him who has more is given and the more we see the more he wants to 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 reveal I, I just believe he wants miracles and signs and wonders to become such a way of life for Christians that 
that it's easy for us to lean back into Him and let Him do what He wants to do. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's one of the most profound um, cues, if you will, uh, that He's looking for yielded. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So often we want to demand things from God or argue with God or bargain with God or I've done so many good things, therefore you, God, should do this. Uh, uh, why, why is yielding the, the real key? Well, because I think it's everything is in His strength. The more that we can lean back into Him and, and recognize that without Him I can do nothing, but in Him, through Christ, I can do all things that... Thank you, God, that I am dead with Him, buried with Him, raised up with Him. I've been crucified with Him, not by my efforts or trying to do it, but by faith. I simply have to humble myself like a little child, reckon myself dead and agree with Him. And the more I, I put myself in that frame of mind that, thank you, God, that it's, you set me free from me. And today it's no longer me who lives, but you. And now my discovery, my journey gets to be, the more I know about Him, the more I understand what I have to give. So I, I you know, like it says in um, First Peter, I think, where he, he talks about that we have everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him, maybe Second Peter chapter 1. And it's that, that's what it is. Through the knowledge of Him, we have everything we need. The more we discover what He's like, the more we, the more we discover who is now living in us. How do you get through the, um, I, I've, I've done that, because I think that is a, a thought within the church, that I made my decision for Christ, and, or I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, so I've, I've done that. How did you get to the point where the yielding was daily and then yielding moment by moment? I think um, recognizing my need is the key. Like, I, I think, you know, it talks in Revelation about people who think they're rich and full and have need of nothing. That doesn't please God. But when you recognize I have need, <laughs> I have intense need all the time. And actually, the more people come from for healing and miracle, the more aware of my deep need for Him I become. And I, I think also for me, studying, I like to study the Gospels with a specific focus on Jesus and the life of Jesus. The more you look at that, or like this morning I was reading the book of Acts, the more you look at that, the more it will provoke you to realize I can't settle for Christianity or life like I've known it. There is a, a desire in the heart of God for the gospel to be preached with signs and wonders and miracles. People need to be saved. We've got one life. There is eternity. It is real. And we have a job to get that message to them. And God says, the best way, my way, is to preach it, not with persuasive words of men's wisdom, but with demonstrations of the Spirit's power. It's not some boutique little part of Christian ministry. It is His plan for seeing the gospel transform lives for eternity. And that's what really matters. In your book, you talk about sowing into your pain. What do you mean by that? Oh, he tells us in Isaiah that for our former shame, pain and disgrace, Isaiah 61, he'll give us double recompense. So for me, that's been very practical mm -hmm. in that I've taken the things that I've walked through and instead of you know, playing the violin and saying, woe is me, taking that scripture in faith saying, right, you said for my former shame, pain and disgrace, it's a scripture written to the Israelites who brought this stuff on themselves through their own misbehavior. He still says, bring me your pain, your shame, your disgrace, and I will give you double. And so I bring him all, I don't waste a drop. God, that was embarrassing. God, that, that hurt. That was painful. God, that was dishonoring. So I sow it in faith and I expect to receive double for my trouble, double recompense. And I tell you, it happens. It's so wonderful. So rather than complaining, I start decreeing, thank you, God, you're giving me double for that disgrace, double for that dishonor, double for that pain, double for that uh, suffering. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, because it's what He wants to do. You know, the, the Word of God is an invitation, not necessarily these promises. They are, the desire of God is 
that we would respond to his invitation in faith. He's saying, here it is, if you want it. Yeah. So I want it. Here's my yes. pain. I'll yes. take double. Thank amen, you, Lord. God. <laughs> <laughs> Abraham, amen, God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. Amen. Well, we promised that Catherine was going to pray. And so we've got some prayer requests uh, that have come in. Ellery writes, my friend Amber is battling an aggressive cancer throughout her body. Doctors also just found two large tumors in her brain. She's only in her early 40s, has nine children. We need a miracle. And then Jonathan writes in, my sister Jill was in a bad car accident and does not look good. Please pray for her to wake up and be okay. And then the last one, please pray for my friend Bill. He was recently diagnosed with kidney cancer. So, Catherine, you ready? Amen. And I know you, as we agree together, God wants to move. Father, I just thank you, Lord. You have more compassion than we do, even on these beautiful people that are being lifted up to you. God, we bring them to you in faith. Lord, I speak to that dear lady with the cancer in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we send forth the word of healing. We speak to those tumors. We say the name of Jesus is greater than any disease. And in the name of Jesus, I thank you by your stripes, they are healed. That dear lady is healed in the name of Jesus. Ellery, be healed. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for that one in the car accident right now in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, hover over them. Wake up in the name of Jesus. Be healed. Father, I thank you, Lord, for healing. Lord, your grace on each one that's reaching out to you for healing right now. I thank you for that uh, kidney, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus being healed. Cancer cannot uh, come stand against the name of Jesus. I speak healing and life in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. And now for anyone who's in a coma, lying in a hospital bed, we just speak to you now. Wake up, come into full consciousness and be healed throughout your body. May the Spirit of God the one who raised Jesus from the dead, raise you now from that bed and give you health and wholeness now in the name of Jesus. We receive it now. We thank you for it, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. amen. If you want to learn more about Catherine and her wonderful ministry, her, her book is called Living in the Miraculous. And it's available wherever books are sold. And Kathy, thank you for being here. What a delight. God thank bless you. you. Terry, over to you. Well, still to come, a runner is mowed down by a hit and run driver and an eyewitness tries to help him. All his clothes incinerated and the dragon took all his skin off. And you could see all his muscles literally just detaching from the bones. See what happened next when we come back. Cross-country runner Matthew Maloney was enjoying a summer day when a car coming out of nowhere hit him and never stopped. Matthew was lying on the ground wondering, am I dying right now? When a woman began praying over him. She was a trauma nurse and her appearance on the scene was just one of many miracles to follow. I believe in prayer because when we pray in agreement, that's when it begins to move for us on our behalf. During my accident, people were praying for a miracle, and uh, God performed the miracle. A Florida intersection marked the start of Matthew Maloney's painful but miraculous journey. On a 2015 Orange Park summer day, the then 18-year-old cross-country runner slowed his stride to pause at a stoplight. As I was running that day, everyone was stopped. Uh, they had these stoplights, and I had the right of way across. Uh, the Blanding and Wells Road. I made eye contact with a truck driver. Retired Navy medic Steve Smith watched the hit and run tragedy unfold. I was waiting on the light to change. Uh, Matthew just crossed in front of our vehicle and we just made the eye contact and I could see a car just speeding and my, man, my daughter was like, no. As I was running across, uh, the car just came out of nowhere and hit me going about 60 to 70 miles an hour on foot. I was holding on to the car and then the, he slammed on his brakes and then I flew off the car and actually landed onto the uh, hard pavement. My military background had kicked in, so I took my truck and I just turned it sideways to block the road. When I jumped out the truck to go see if it was all right, all his clothes incinerated and uh, the, the, the dragon took all his skin off. 
and you know, you could see all his muscles literally just detaching from the bones. So even in the bleeding out, I begin to uh, try to get up, you know, thinking I could. Um, and that's the moment I realized that there's something very wrong and then questions of, am I dying right now? I was laying on the ground and there was this woman who actually touched me and uh, she began to pray over me and she was a nurse. Robin Denny, a trauma nurse, was in her car and heard the collision as she approached the intersection. I got out, walked over to the scene and seen Matthew laying face down on the ground. His legs, his arms, everything looked broken from head to toe. He was flayed open, so I knelt down next to him, praying for peace with him, no pain, that God would let him live. Her touch meant a lot to me because it had me remember, uh, man, God can do so much more, even what I can't even think right now, and help me remember to keep fighting. Just a mile and a half from the accident is the Springs Church, where Matthew's community of friends and pastors began praying. It seemed like it was a very grave situation. The reports back were that legs could be amputated, he could have hands that are amputated. Even death was the possible outcome of it. So our prayers were sincere and they were real. We believe that as we call on Jesus' name, he's able to come and he's able to do uh, what we can't do, so we, we immediately begin to pray. The doctors were most concerned about my legs and my left arm. There was receiving no blood flow. At that time, I couldn't really actually speak. So in my heart, I began to actually respond in prayer. I knew God could hear my thoughts and what my heart was knowing and going through. If I even right now lose my legs and my left arm, help my heart to trust you and take me through this. Matthew suffered multiple fractures. Ten surgeries immediately followed, with a threat of amputation still lingering. I've seen your pastor on a Sunday morning, he makes a declaration, we're gonna pray that Matthew will walk across this stage one day and give his testimony. Testify on the stage of, of, his, of the miracle. So we were praying in that vein. I had to promise just as much in the hospital that God was gonna heal me in less than a year. Faith is not only just believing, but even though you can't see it, knowing God's gonna still do what he said. Out of people praying the next day, the doctors came in and said, we found a, another way to keep your legs and left arm. Three months later, Matthew left the hospital for physical therapy that moved him from wheelchair to walking. It was horrible, it was grueling. I was in pain. I wanted to so badly walk, and I was still in the small stages of learning how to walk. Step by step, Matt, step by step. When I walked for the very first time, I was so uh, excited. Uh, it's so significant that I can run. I'm like, man, look at the miracle you've done, Lord. I'm like, wow, this is so cool. But not before Matthew returned to his praying and awaiting church. The Bible says that the fervent prayers of the righteous availeth much. And it's one thing to say that, it's another thing to experience it. And that was one of the days when Matthew walked back into the church after the healing process came to hear the, just the cheers and the joy and the sense of God actually does miracles. But our suffering is actually the place that the Bible promises joy. I'm gonna go run to God and give them the pain. I'm gonna be honest with them about what I'm going through so I can receive the joy and know what he's gonna have for me. But at the same time, I'm gonna trust him. Matthew's biggest step was still ahead, confronting his anger directed toward his hit and run accuser. Honestly, I wanted Eric Burnish dead. <laughs> I hated his guts when I heard about that he was found and he was in prison. So prayer was the place that God changed my heart to love him. I wasn't at all bitter anymore because during that six months of a process of God helped me to really forgive him and pray for him, during the courtroom hearing, Matthew verbally and directly forgave. I looked him straight in the eye and I said, I forgive you. I forgive you for stripping me from all my walking ability, for even running from the scene and not helping me. I forgive you for that. I forgive you for everything. God help me to forgive you and love you in the secret place. And that was the place of prayer. Man, his story um, is, is evidence that God is, is still able to answer prayers and that God is faithful. Prayer is everything to me. That's the place where actually I see God change my heart. It's not going to be the way we want it sometimes, but He will move in allowing Him to help you through your everyday life. Wow. You know, you better know who He is before you find yourself in a place of such need. What an amazing story of not just the power of prayer, but the power of relationship. And that's what your God wants with you. He talks about being your father. 
Jesus talks about being your redeemer, taking that which was lost and redeeming it, bringing it back, saving it, giving it value. No God, no God. He's available and wants to be known by you. His arms are outstretched to you. His invitation is come home, come home to my heart. I have intentionally, intentionally created you with a plan and a purpose in mind. Don't miss out on God's purpose for you. If you need to pray with someone today about a need in your life, our number's toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Gordon. Here's a word for you from 1 John. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he's hearing us, he will answer that prayer. If you need prayer, we're here for you. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call 1-800-700-7000. God bless. We'll see you again.